Okay, so we've dealt with uh, definitions. We've dealt with terms, and that's great. We've gotten a good start. Uh, but we can't stick with terms for the rest of the semester, in fact. <laughs> I mean, we could. It's easy to talk about definitions for an entire semester, but we're not going to. Uh, instead, we're going to move on to propositions. Now, propositions are what are true or false, right? or what are true or false. And terms compose propositions. Terms uh, define or don't define, right? They define well or they don't. Propositions are what are true or false. And then arguments, as we'll see in a little while, arguments are what are valid or invalid. Okay. So let's move on to propositions. So propositions. Propositions are what are true or false. Uh, way to think about this is to think about propositions compared to other sentences. So there's lots of sentences that are neither true nor false. Not every sentence is what is true or false. So how was the weather today? That's an interrogative. It's a sentence. It's a question. But it's neither true nor false. It is weird to say it is false that how was the weather today? That's a nonsensical statement right there. Yeah. I, you know, if I responded, the weather was beautiful, well, that's something that's true or false. Right? The weather was sunny, that's something that's true or false. Yeah. Um, go stand over there. That is, not a, that is not a sentence that is either true or false. That's a, con a command, an imperative. Yeah. Uh, it would be weird, again, it would be weird to say, it is false too, go stand over there. No. <laughs> that's not something that's true or false. <laughs> so propositions, uh, we can think about it as, as sentences if you like, but that, that might be a little bit too narrow. But you know, uh, propositions are what are true or false. Right? There are trees behind me. That's something that's true. There's an elephant behind me. That's something that's false. Okay? So propositions are what are true, these things that are either true or false. Right? Uh, after this, we have to start thinking about atomic propositions. All right, so we've got propositions, but we're not done yet. Right? There's actually lots of different kinds of propositions. Propositions are what is true or false. Well, let's start with atomic propositions. Now, atomic is you know your, your smallest, most basic proposition. It, is, it has a, a subject and a predicate. A subject is what's described. A predicate is what's describing. Right? So what? This tree is leaning over. That's an atomic proposition. That tree, tree, that's the subject. Leaning over is the predicate. Okay. Uh, if you take you know, just either one of those two, right. that tree, that's not a proposition. I might be pointing to something. You might understand that I'm trying to point to something, but that's not a proposition. That's neither true nor false. Okay. Is leaning over. That is also not true or false, right? Uh, it isn't until I combine the subject and the predicate together that I get an atomic proposition. It's the smallest proposition. You can't break it down any further and still have something that's either true or false. Right. So that tree is leaning over. That is an atomic proposition. Now, you know, I want to warn you that uh, atomic propositions don't necessarily mean small. They just mean simplest. And what that means is you can't break it down any further and still have something that's true or false. So what? Uh, let's think of a lengthy atomic proposition. Uh, the uh, sparse landscape uh, located within uh, the state park uh, conveyed a sense of beauty and desolation at once. That's still an atomic proposition. The sparse, lo the sparse landscape located within the state park, that whole thing is the subject. That whole thing is the subject. Conveyed a sense of, what did I say, desolation and beauty. That whole thing is the predicate. 
uh, as proof of this, right? Just try and take one or the other. The sparse, lo- uh, the sparse land, ca- the sparse landscape located within the state park. That doesn't. That's not something that's either true or false. Or if I just said, conveyed a sense of uh, desolate, uh, loneliness and beauty. I keep changing the predicate. Conveyed a sense of, des- of loneliness and beauty. That is also not something that is either true or false. So when you break that apart, you don't have a proposition. Yeah. It's when only when you take the whole thing, even though it's long, right? We can, we can simplify it. Uh, the area over there conveyed loneliness and beauty. Okay. That's a smaller proposition. Uh, but still, the original propos- the original example that I gave, the uh, uh, what did I say, the sparse landscape located within the state park, even though it's got some modifiers in there, that's still just a subject. That's still just a subject. So when you put it all together, that's when you have the atomic proposition. Okay. So this is the smallest proposition that we're going to deal with, and this is what you have to keep an eye out for when you're reading these sentences. You have to look out for the atomic propositions. You have to spot subjects and predicates. You have to understand the meaning of the sentence. This is not merely a mechanical affair. Right? Google can't do this. You can. Yeah. So you've got to get in there and comprehend what these terms mean uh, in, order, in order to spot the subject and the predicate. You know, I say Google can't do this, but I bet they're not far. <laughs> in the meantime, however, you need to do this work. You need to read the sentence Instead of having the computer think for you, think for yourself, right? think for yourself and comprehend, understand what's the subject, what's the predicate, what's, what's being described, and what is doing the describing. You spot that and you've got your atomic proposition. All right, well, we've compared atomic propositions or compared propositions to other kinds of sentences. Right, propositions are what's true or false. And we talked with, about atomic propositions, and these are the smallest kinds of propositions. Well, we've also got complex propositions beyond that. Right? And complex propositions join up atomic propositions in a variety of ways. Right? Or they kind of modify right, uh, uh, atomic propositions in a variety of ways. So uh, one obvious way is when you put two atomic propositions together. Right? The Weather was beautiful and the grass was green. The weather is beautiful is an atomic proposition. The grass is green is another atomic proposition. You put them together with the word and. Right? It's called a conjunction. Um, this is a complex proposition. Right? It's taken two atomic propositions, put them together. Now, this is not good or bad, right? I'm not saying this is a bad thing, but you have to be aware of this. The word and is neither a subject nor predicate. We we don't say things like, well, the tree and. The tree was anding. The tree anded very well. No, no, this is all nonsense, right? (laughs) And doesn't have meaning as either a subject or predicate. It does something else. It joins up two atomic propositions or two, you know, two propositions, right? Could be atomic and complex, right? Could be either one. Uh, It joins up propositions and says both of these are true. Both of these are true. So you've got to be able to spot atomic propositions within complex propositions. So I already gave you one clue. I got and. Other kinds of complex propositions would be disjunctions, either or. Well, either I'm in a state park or I'm uh, what's it? Either I'm on public land or I'm on private land. Right? Th- those are the two possibilities. A disjunction says at least one of these are true. So one atomic proposition, I'm on public land. Here's another atomic proposition, I'm on private land. These are both atomic propositions. And they're kind of you know, connected together with either or. Uh, by the way, I'm on public land. Just so nobody freaks out, right? <laughs> I'm not trespassing on somebody's property. So... Uh, when you're looking at propositions, you've got to find the atomic proposition within the sentence. And again, either or, or even just the word or, it is not a subject or a predicate. Right? The tree was oaring. No, right? that doesn't have meaning that way. Or was beautiful today. No, that, that, that has no meaning. That's a nonsense statement. Right? Nonsense statement. Okay. 
Uh, other kinds of connectives, these are called logical connectives, by the way. We had conjunctions, both and, uh, disjunctions, either or. We have conditionals, if then. Okay? Uh, if I'm on public land, then I'm in a park. There we go. There's a, well, <laughs> that's actually not a true conditional. There's lots of ways to be on public land, but not in a park. Um, if I'm in a state park, then I'm on public land. There we go. If I'm in a state park, then I'm on public land. That's a conditional. Okay, that's a conditional. Uh, well, what the conditional says is the, if the first proposition is true, then the second is also true. Right? So if I'm in a park, if that proposition is true, the second proposition, I am on public land, is also true. Uh, the last one is not really a connective in the sense that it you know, you know, joins up two different propositions. It really just modifies a single proposition. It's negation, right? Negation. And this is when, you, when you're stating in some way, shape, or form that the subject is not described by the predicate, is not described by the predicate. I am not on private land. That is a negation. I am not on private land. Now, here's the kicker, right? You might think that the subject is me and not on private land is the predicate. No. No. You have to learn to read the atomic proposition within that negation. Okay? The negation is actually on private land. I'm the subject. On private land is the predicate. The negation says I'm not on private land. Okay? Notice that doesn't say where I am. <clears throat> um, so, so we want to be careful, right? When you have a negation, the predicate is not the negated predicate, right? and the predicate is what is negated. Okay? So, if we if we say, for example, I am not on private land, subject is I or me, the predicate is on private land, but then it's negated, making this a complex proposition. It's negated. Right? I will try another example. Um, I am not climbing a tree. Right? What's the subject? Me. What's the predicate? Not climbing a tree. No, excuse me. <laughs> See, I just messed up. What's the, what's the subject? Me. What's the predicate? Climbing a tree. Right? And then the negation is added on to that atomic proposition. And the negation says, well, it's not, the predicate does not describe the subject in that way. So you want to be careful when you're reading. Right? You want to be careful when you're reading. Uh, you want to make sure that you're able to spot the predicate, the subject and a predicate, within a complex proposition. This is easier when you've got both and, either or, and if then. It's easier that way. It gets more complicated when you deal with negation. So just remember the first thing, right? If you spot a negation, the negation of the predicate is not the predicate. The predicate is the predicate, not the negation of the predicate. So here are some other negations. Uh, I am not eight feet tall. Subject is I. Eight feet tall is the predicate, and not makes it the complex proposition. All right? Um, uh, elephants are not reptiles. Elephant is the subject. Reptiles is the predicate, and then the negation is it. not reptiles is not the predicate. Not reptiles is not the predicate. Reptiles is the predicate. Not makes it a complex proposition. So we got atomic propositions, right? Or we got propositions, propositions of what's true or false. We have spot the atomic propositions. This is the subject and the predicate. And we compare atomic propositions to complex. Spotting complex, most of the complexes is easy. You got both and. You got either or. Okay. But when you look at the negation, negated predicates are not the predicate. Okay. Uh, uh, the predicate is the predicate. The negation makes the whole makes that atomic proposition then a complex proposition. All right, now that we've got all that taken care of, <laughs> let's move on to how we're going to symbolize these things. Truth tables. Uh, take one. Okay, so we're going to symbolize our arguments, right? When we're dealing with formal logic, we symbolize our arguments. And that just means that we use letters 
to represent atomic propositions, and we use other symbols uh, to represent uh, basically complex propositions, the relationships between atomic propositions. And then we're going to have a, have a way to symbolize the whole argument, right? what distinguishes premises from the conclusion and the inferences that we make along the way to reach the conclusion. Okay. Now, this can probably get a little bit tricky, and usually if you know teaching this course and dive right in, it confuses everybody. So let, let me just explain why we're doing this. Right? So when we're, you know, we've talked about terms. Terms are either, either defined or they don't define. Right? And you can evaluate terms in term, by the kinds and the rules. If it's not one of the kinds, well, maybe you, know, maybe you can find another kind of defining, okay, but you'd better, <laughs> it better at least adhere to those rules, right? Those rules uh, better be followed. And if it doesn't follow those rules, well, it's not a good definition. Uh, we've got propositions. Propositions are either true or false, or either true or false. Yeah. And there's lots of ways to figure out whether propositions are true or false through investigation, through conceptual analysis. There, there's, there's lots of ways we go about doing this. But basically, a proposition is true just in case the subject is, you know, when you're dealing with atomic propositions, right? when the subject is accurately predicated by the predicate, and it's false when it's not, when you deal with atomic propositions. And if you've got complex propositions, well, the, you know, whether they're true or not, that changes depending upon the relationship uh, expressed by the complex proposition. But we'll just stick with the atomic proposition for right now. So terms are either define or don't define. Propositions are either true or false. That's how we're evaluating propositions, how we're evaluating terms. And arguments are either valid or invalid. Arguments are either valid or invalid. How, that's how we are evaluating arguments. So uh, valid means, and we're talking about deductive validity, right? I know you'll be used valid in a lot of different ways in popular talk, you know, pop talk these days, usually means something like you're entitled to that belief or it's well supported or may, you know, maybe something like, or it's not offensive, right? That's <laughs> how we talk about valid versus invalid. We're not dealing with that in deductive logic, right? With deductive logic, an argument is deductively valid just in case the truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion. Or in other words, an argument is deductively valid just in case, uh, you know, if, if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. Right? Or another way of saying it's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. Right? So with the deductively valid argument, if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. Right? Now, we're not going to investigate whether arguments are valid or invalid by figuring out whether the premises and the conclusion are all true. No. In fact, you can have an argument where the premises are all true and the conclusion is true, and yet the argument is not valid. So here's one. Uh, if a, um, what? If an organism is a tree, then an organism is a plant. That organism is a plant. Therefore, that organism is a tree. Both the premises and the conclusion are, both the premises are true and the conclusion is true. If an organism is a tree, then an organism is a plant. That's true. That organism is a, is a plant. That is also true. That organism is a tree. That is also true. But the argument is not valid. Hmm? Is not valid. Okay. Now, <clears throat> um, it, it instantiates a uh, kind of fallacy called affirming the consequent, in case you're wondering. But we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. <laughs> And the reason why it's not valid is because an argument of that form, okay, an argument of that form, uh, we have a prem, you have a, con a conditional, you assert the consequent, and therefore you, you infer the antecedent. That is invalid. You can make mistakes with that all the time. If you're enrolled at San Antonio College, then you're a member of San Antonio College. I am a member of San Antonio College. Therefore, I'm enrolled at San Antonio College. No. <laughs> I'm not enrolled at San Antonio College. I'm a faculty at San Antonio College. Right? I teach at San Antonio College, so I'm a member of San Antonio College. That's how I'm a member of San Antonio College, by being faculty, not because I'm enrolled as a student. All right, so that form of the argument, that's invalid. That form does not guarantee a true conclusion given true premises. 
So what we're trying to do is to figure out whether these arguments are valid or invalid. We're not going to figure that out simply by discovering whether the premises and the conclusion are all true. Right? That's not going to do it. That's a mistaken idea about evaluating arguments. Rather, we are going to uh, look at the relationship between the premises and the conclusion. Now, in order to do that, we need to uh, look at all the different ways or the possibilities of, of the truth of these atomic propositions. And to do that, we'll use a truth table. Now remember, propositions are either true or false. Right? So we'll lay out, you know, starting out with our truth tables, we'll lay out all the different possible combinations of our atomic propositions as either true or false. Right? As either true or false. And this will help us determine the, uh, uh, whether the argument is valid or invalid. Now we had rules for defining. Well, now we're going to have rules for constructing our truth tables. And we're going to do this because we're all going to construct our truth tables in the same way. If, if five of you work on a truth table, I should be able, you know, and you're working independently, all five following the rules should look exactly the same, right? Whole class <laughs> should look exactly the same. Okay, so uh, we're going to have some rules for constructing these truth tables. Let's take a look at those. Okay, rule number one for constructing our truth tables. First, you have to identify all the atomic propositions, right? You're reading a passage, find those atomic propositions. Great. Rule one, symbolize atomic propositions with letters P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. I doubt we're going to get to an argument greater than you. <laughs> all right, don't, don't worry about that. Um, but this is, how, this is what's going to symbolize atomic propositions, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. All right, that's rule one. So you read your passage, and I've even had students say they go in with a highlighter and they, they highlight the atomic proposition. Rule two, if you symbolize an atomic proposition with P, every instance of that atomic proposition in a passage also gets P. So if you find an atomic proposition, trees are plants, in a passage, every time that proposition pops up in that passage, it's also symbolized as P. Atomic propositions are going to pop up probably repeatedly in any given argument. And you're going to keep track of that atomic proposition with one and only one letter. By the way, right, keep in mind how negations could trip you up here. You want to make sure that if you have trees or plants, somewhere in the argument, and some other place in the argument or passage that says trees are not plants, the atomic proposition there is still trees are plants. It's just negated. Hmm? So that atomic proposition, trees are plants, is there even though the sentence says trees are not plants. Right. So that's something you got to be careful, careful about. Right. That, that's going to probably be the biggest trip up. Uh, it, you know, just you know, have alarms go off whenever you see a negation. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> There's something going on here. And just recognize that you got an atomic proposition embedded in the negation. All right. All right. So rule one, atomic propositions are symbolized as P, Q, R, S, T, and so on. Rule two, <coughs> if an atomic proposition gets assigned a letter, it gets that same letter throughout the rest of the passage. All right. So you want to consistently uh, label your, uh, uh, um, uh, consistently label your atomic propositions. Okay, so the first part, the first two rules deal with finding atomic propositions and symbolizing them. The second part deals with uh, the rows of our truth table. So remember, we're, we're trying to give all possible combinations of these, uh, 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 of true and false uh, with these atomic propositions. Okay, so rule three that deals with the number of rows assigned in a truth table. The number of rows is equal to two to the power of the number of atomic propositions. Now, I don't mean, you know, you're breaking up with the passage. I mean, you know, P, Q, R, and S, right? You know, how many uh, distinct atomic propositions there are. Um, so if trees are plants is one atomic proposition and uh, trees are green is, an, is another atomic proposition, that's just it. It doesn't matter if you've got a wide combination of uh, atomic propositions within the passage, and, you know, embedded within complex propositions, right? 
So the number of rows of uh, in your truth table is equal to 2 to the power of the number of atomic propositions. So if you've got one atomic proposition, here's a complex proposition with one atomic proposition. Either I'm on public property or I am not on public property. That's a sentence with one atomic proposition. And the atomic proposition is I'm on public property. And it's a disjunction with the negation of it. Right? So if an argument has one atomic proposition, it has two rows. Right? It's assigned the letter P, it following rule one and rule two, and it has two rows. Right? And it would just be true or false. Uh, if we have two atomic propositions, right, the number of rows is two to the power of two atomic propositions. Well, that's four rows. Four rows. If we've got three atomic propositions, right, that means we have eight rows in our truth table. You see how the number of rows can grow pretty quickly. If we've got four atomic propositions, that's 16 rows. If we've got five atomic propositions, that's 32 rows. If we've got six atomic propositions, that's 64 rows. And I'm not going to go further than that. You can see what's in the book. Right? Figure it out for yourself, right? Um, <coughs> so the number of atomic propositions is going to increase the number of rows in our truth table. All right. So two, uh, uh, rule one, atomic propositions are symbolized with P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. Rule two. If an atomic proposition is assigned a letter, it keeps that same letter throughout the rest of the passage. You always assign that atomic proposition with that same passage. And again, I've seen students like going with a marker and they, or, or digital highlighter, and they get the first <laughs> atomic second, and they keep with that color through the rest of the passage. All right. Rule three, the number of rows of the truth table is equal to two to the power of the number of atomic propositions. All right. Rule four. This is how you assign the truth values. Right? This is how you assign the truth values uh, for, our, 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 for our truth table. Uh, you take the top half of the row. Uh, so, you, so you take the leftmost row, the leftmost row, right? You assign the top half true and the bottom half false. So this is really easy when you have one atomic proposition because you got two rows. The first row is T, the second row is F. Boop. <laughs> Suppose we have two atomic propositions. The left row, the leftmost row. Right? If we have two atomic propositions, we got four rows. You go to the leftmost, excuse me, the leftmost column, the leftmost column. Rows one and two get true for P, for P. Rows three and four get false. Moving over one row to the right, you take just that, just that half that gets true, and you take the top half of that, and it gets true, and the bottom half gets false, and you follow that pattern for the rest of that column. All right. So for four rows, right, rows one and two for P get true, rows three and four get false. For Q, right, we got true, false, true, false. All right? Suppose we have three atomic propositions. P, Q, and R. That's eight rows. P, you go to the leftmost column, P, rows one through four get true, true. Rows five through eight get false. All right? Go over to Q. Just take those rows that have true for P and divide it up there. So that, that'll just be four rows. Well, then for Q, rows one and two get true. Rows three and four get false and repeat it on the way down. Two true, two false. Then R gets true, false, true, false, true, false, true, false. Okay. Suppose we have four, four variables, P, Q, R, and S. Okay. Now that is 16 rows. Okay. So you go over to P, the leftmost column. You go over to P. Rows 1 through 8 get true. Get true. Rows 9 through 16 get false. Okay. Now just stick with those first eight rows, right? That you got that you had for Q, uh, for P. Go over to Q. Rows one through four get true. Rows five through eight get false. That's the pattern. Copy it, paste it all the way down. Right? R. 
right? So Q had four rows, right? Four. R, uh, as to four rows is true at the top there. So R, rows one and two get true. Rows five, uh, three and four get false. Okay. Copy that pattern all the way down. S, then will just be true, false, true, false, true, false, true, false. Okay. So if you follow these rules, the leftmost column, the first half will be true, the bottom half will be false, the rightmost column will always be true, false, true, false, true, false, true, false. Right? <coughs> now when you do it this way, you will find every, po you will provide every possible combination of true and false for these atomic propositions. Right? And that's how we're going to start assigning the truth value to our atomic propositions in our truth table. Let's get this skill down now. <laughs> Start identifying the atomic propositions and how to symbolize, how to assign the truth, how to symbolize the atomic propositions and assign truth value to them in our truth table. And we'll get to filling out the rest of the truth table in later chapters.